Hi, Adrian. How are you? Oh, Hanaf, I'm so obsessed with you. I like must have watched your TED talk a hundred times. I'm a hundred <laughs> of your views. I'm just thrilled that you're here to share with our whole international momentum market today. You're incredible gifts, and they're so manifold. Well, thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for all your kind words. I hope uh, you'll feel the, the same way after I finish in half an hour from now. I'm sure I will. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> Hopefully. Let's, let, let's see. So, uh, hello, everyone. And what I thought I'll do, Adrian, is uh, I'll give a little presentation. So I'll share my screen, and then we can do some Q&A together. Lovely. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cool. do that. Um, here's my screen, share and uh, play. So, um, so you see my opening slide and slides are moving, right? Okay, so um, what I would like to talk about today is um, about two sides of my work. One is, uh, as you can see on my self-portrait on the right, is really about the creative process but really trying to decipher what in my creative process, what in the creative process of any artist is uh, relevant to life. And uh, my point uh, that I will try to make is that it's very relevant uh, as a practice for life. Art is a good place to practice dealing with hardships and dealing with uncertainty, stuff that is so relevant for us uh, today. And, uh, and then I would also like to share with you my work with other people, how other people create and how you can create at home a collage of your family. And I will talk a little bit about how collage is really a metaphor for, for family, for community, for, for any kind of, uh, of, of group. So uh, let's get started. And, um, and basically, I speak um, through objects. We will be talking today throughout the objects. I come from the caricature world, for, for, from the idea of creating portraits of famous people. As Adrian said, lots of work in Israel, from Golda Meir to David Ben-Gurion. I worked in Israel in Aretz a lot, in the newspaper Aretz. And, um, and I've been doing this for 30 years. I like to say that I'm paid to play with objects. And, um, and I've done everyone from Lincoln, who was the cover of my What Presents Are Made Of book, to America's current president, Donald Trump. And as you can see, the objects communicate. The objects tell a story you get some idea about uh, Donald Trump throughout, through my choices for objects. The banana and the baloney communicate something. But the objects communicate in different ways. There are objects like the eyes and the eyebrows of Obama here that uh, are very clear. They're clear why, more or less, I put them. But there are objects like the nose of Obama that opens a space in which each person might come up with a different idea of why it is there. So not, I always ask kids and adults, why do you think I put that? And a kid not long ago told me, I know exactly why you put it. It is a tea kettle. And when the um, water boils, the lid flies away and that symbolizes freedom. So that kid really took his own path. He listened to his own interpretation. And this is the beauty of objects and of art in general. They send you on your own path. They open a space in which you can listen to your own voice. And, um, and a lot of it is done through playfulness. Just as a game, art is a protected space in which we can fail, we can take chances we can be frustrated and the worst that can happen is that we make a bad piece of art no one dies of that so just as we might lose sometimes in a game and life goes on the same happens when we are creating um, art and this is actually why we can come up with new things because we take chances we are 
we are fearless. So um, throughout playfulness is actually also how I discover my own way of creating. There are proofs that when I was a kid, I was a normal kid playing with crayons just like any other kid. This is me in Uruguay. I was born in South America in Uruguay. And uh, my childhood drawings are all of cows and steaks. And this is my fourth grade teacher. When we were, when I was 11, we made Aliyah to Israel. And as a kid in the 70s in Israel, I grew up wanting to draw caricatures, copying the newspapers. Life took me to other places. I studied uh, computers and science in high school. I was for five years in the army. And when I finished the army and I applied to Bezalel, to art school in Jerusalem, I wasn't accepted. And, uh, and I had to go to New York. This is how I ended up in the 80s in New York, starting to draw again. But, um, but I felt very frustrated with my drawing abilities. I felt like I wasn't technically good enough. I felt uh, stuck. There was something I wanted to do, and I didn't know how to do it. I felt like I had hit a wall. And uh, when we hit a wall, it's obviously painful, and we feel insecure, unable. But uh, a wall is also an opportunity to start rethinking of other ways, other routes, other roads to take. And, um, and that's what happened to me. I started to look for other ways of drawing caricatures. And, um, and at that time I found this poster of the great dictator movie of Charlie Chaplin. And that poster gave me the idea that actually with very few lines, you can convey something, you can communicate something. It is not always about the technique about the drawing. It's more about the communication. And I realized I was a very good communicator. I couldn't draw very well, but I could communicate my ideas. And at the same time, it was the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein conquered Kuwait. And uh, I, I decided to draw a portrait of Saddam using this idea of putting as little shapes as possible. And as I did that, I came upon by coincidence, a box of matches, which uh, immediately gave me the idea to become the mustache. So it was a coincidence. I did not plan it, but it was a coincidence that changed my life. Pretty soon, I started to create portraits for different magazines. And a couple of years later, this portrait of Barbara Streisand won the gold medal from the Society of Illustrators of New York. So that gave me a big boost to my career. But it's clear to me that uh, I'm telling you all this story because it taught me to respect that long and winding road. The idea that any, any process of creation, any process of um, of development, of education, takes time and goes through uncertainty. And um, Steve Jobs said it very well, that it's very easy to connect the dots looking back. It's very difficult to do it while we are in the middle of that process. And what 30 years of doing that taught me is to trust the process, to trust the idea that if you are trying different directions, something will happen. You don't know what, but something will happen and you will be there noticing. Because the worst thing we can do to ourselves is to be dependent on an IKEA-like manual. There is no IKEA that teaches us how to be creative or how to live our own individual lives. And when we are creative, we need to trust that we're not gonna be driving with everybody else on the highway. And you all know the feeling when we drive on a highway that sometimes we ask ourselves, who drove for the past uh, 20 minutes? Because we did it automatically as if we were on default. We are not there, we are not at the present. When we create and 
what uh, you will be experiencing when you do a collage is more like traveling through a scenic road and noticing, paying attention. What happens when we travel on a scenic route is that we are influenced by what we see. We pay attention, we see. And by the way, in Hebrew, to pay attention is la sim lev, to put our heart. And to see, according to Paul Valéry, is to forget the name of whatever it is that we are looking at. What Valérie asks us to do is something very difficult. How can we forget a name of something after we know it? But what Valérie is also saying is that in those moments in which we haven't defined, we haven't tagged, we haven't labeled, we don't know those are the moments in which we will discover something new. We might have a chance to discover something new. So art and play help us enter this place in which we supposedly forget the name of something. And I'm going to show it to you now. We are going to trick our brains into entering a new space, a space of playfulness. For example, what happens when we discover faces? The world is filled with faces, and when we are discovering them, we are actually applying the sentence of Paul Valéry. For a second, we forget the name of something, and we are experiencing it intuitively. And being creative is very much connected to listening to your intuition. Being creative is actually very connected to allowing yourself to be an individual, to have an individual thought. But we'll talk about it more later. So here are a couple of more faces. I'm sure you've seen these ones. And um, so that, um, that metaphor of the scenic road, I think is very relevant also to the idea of putting together a collage. I think in life, we generally go throughout our life collecting, collecting experiences, collecting uh, people, collecting um, failures, successes, collecting uh, places that we've been to. And all of us as Jews, we've been to many, many, many different places. I myself have lived in four countries. And when we slowly put it together in our own individual way, we create the collage that is what we are made of individually. So when I talk about the process of creation, I would like to um, mentioned three aspects that I think are, more, are very important. One is allow yourself to try and err. Make mistakes, but try to create a space which, in which you can make mistakes without paying a high price for them. For example, in my portraits, I glue only at the very end. So that allowed me in this case, to try 20 or 30 eyes for Einstein until I found the right ones. The second one is pay attention to those happy accidents. The happy accidents are always there and they're waiting for us to notice them. Part of paying attention, being in the present, is that it allows us to see, to see those happy accidents. When I made a picture of Homer Simpson, I didn't like my ideas. I threw them to the garbage can on my studio, and then I realized that the garbage can looked exactly like the mouth of Homer. It was there, waiting to be seen. And the advanced idea is to help them come, to help the happy accidents come. And the third thing is to allow yourself to be flexible. No creation will look at the end anything as like it looked at the beginning. A creation constantly change. And if you don't allow yourself to be flexible, to forgive yourself that things are not gonna be as you plan them, nothing new will, um, will evolve. Because the great ideas are not here. The great ideas are in the relationship between you and 
your project, whatever your project is. So um, allowing myself to be flexible, I moved maybe 15 years ago when my um, art started to become more popular in Israel. I moved from just being an editorial illustrator to create uh, books for children. And I've created many books in English and uh, in Hebrew. You see some of them here behind me. And um, once my Hi, we got disconnected. Okay, can, uh, can you guys hear me now? Do I get a yes? I guess I'll continue. You're good, Hanel, you're good. Okay, okay, I continue. I hope uh, you guys arrive to hear. Um, so, as I was saying, the big surprise was discovering how Adults can create this way, um, not this way. I mean, in any other situation, adults would be creating stick figures, but it turns out that we all like to play, and most of that, we all like to talk about ourselves. is our favorite subject, and art allows us to do that, and you wouldn't believe it, but those are lawyers. Uh, so I realized that pretty much anybody can create this way, and what's interesting is that after we create, we want to talk about what we did. So the creation pre precedes a cognitive evaluation and, and language, talking about our creations. And, um, and we do it from a point of um, ableness, from a point of feeling proud of what we did. And pretty much anybody from Harvard, this is in Harvard Kennedy School of Government, to um, elderly people, to children can create this way. And what's, uh, what's interesting is also when people create in groups. So I've been working a lot with teachers and with different types of groups in Israel. Part of my work has been gathering together Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians, and I'm very proud of that. When people play together, they create a different way to connect to each other. And, um, and I want to end with showing you some examples of families creating together. Pretty much, as I was saying all along, collage is a great metaphor for, for family. So I know that you are invited to create a portrait of your family. And I want to show you a couple of examples. Uh, we saw this one at the beginning. This is a family that created uh, faces and bodies, but uh, you don't have to do that and you don't have to think of it as a creation that needs to look like yourself. It's not about creating a likeness. It's about telling a story through the objects and letting at least one object tell something about each one of the people in the family. You can also create um, the house. You can create the places that you long to be uh, the vacation, you can create one character that is made out of different objects that represent different people in the family. You can create a metaphor. This family created a river as a metaphor for family. And some families that couldn't get along very well decide what to do, created uh, pets. So I've always get, I always get lots of cats and dogs. So I want to end with uh, a picture of a guy 
This is a kid from Eritrea that participated in one of my workshops in Israel, in, the, in a school for refugees in Tel Aviv. And um, he just arrived to Israel. He didn't speak Hebrew very well. And supposedly he didn't understand what I wanted. I told him, I gave him a board. I said, you glue everything on the board. And instead he glued everything on himself. But the fact is that he ignored the instructions. He entered his own space. The playfulness and the art allowed him to listen to his own voice. And in some way, he created an Africa mask in Israel, connecting to a very deep inner voice. And this is the beauty of art. Art can make you feel free, free to listen to your own voice and free to, um, to engage in a process which you don't really know where it goes. But as I said before, it's about trusting the process because from my experience, we are always inside that process. So um, if you wanna hear a little bit more about myself, my website is pivenworld.com. My Facebook is pivenworld as well. And, um, and pretty much this is uh, it. So Adrian, are you there? I am, I am so here. The entire time you were speaking, I was typing madly all of the things that I wanted to remember and turn into memes with your permission, of course. So I just want to ask you about a couple of the things also our viewers were asking. Um, but I want to begin with, you said that games can prepare us for life. How right. so? What is it about a game that is a preparation to go through the circular paths of life? Why? Why a game? Okay, well, we, we see, we, we kind of used to hear that, that games that animals play in order to practice hunting and practice, you know, and, and kids uh, um, can become, can express that um, certain anger and violence by, by playing, you know, perhaps with another kid. And, and it's better to do it there than in life. And of course, when we play rugby, when we play soccer, when we do all this uh, aggressive uh, be behavior. But I, I would like to take it to the art, how art can prepare you for life. And, sure. and when I do art, I fail. I fail all that time. And my failures are called sketches. And when you create, you get used to the idea that you fell, fell, fell. But okay, it's not right here, but this thing I can use. Um, the next one is also not right, but I can use that. From So you really understand that any success um, goes through lots of failures. And, um, and, and, and I feel that this is in the same way that you... Um, if you miss a shoot on a basketball game or you miss a goal in soccer, you don't enter a state of depression. You, go, you continue playing because you are in the protected space of a game. And it's not the real life. So as hard as it is losing, we accept that losing is part of a game. So those are practices that, uh, that I feel that art has you know, a similar idea with with playing wow that that is really deep you know you did mention at one point that you don't glue things down so that you have permission you don't make a commitment but sometimes in life we've got to glue stuff down so right. how do you make let's say something is done how can you turn it into art even right. after it's glued down wrong if you know what i mean yeah, well, I think, you know, that, um, again, I'm, I'm speaking about collage as a metaphor, of right. course, and, 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 and it's hard. It's, it's hard to be in this state of confusion in art and in life, you right. know, uh, when we don't know what is the right path to take. We all have kids um, in colleges, uh, in their 20s, struggling. We all struggle ourselves. So it's always hard to, to, to handle that. But, um, but I think um, at certain point, there needs to be a time dedicated to exploration. Uh -huh. And we need to trust that time and to remind ourselves that this is a time for exploration. Yes, there are deadlines. When a deadline comes, um, you need to do your best 
thinking in a burning building. There is no other choice. But I feel from my experience that when I need to glue everything, in, and, and from seeing also people in the workshops, when I say, okay, guys, we have three, four more minutes, you need to glue everything, people are there, people are attuned, people are sharp, and, uh, and they make decisions because they spent a lot of time before thinking and, and trying. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. So essentially, you're saying that experimentation, your teens and perhaps your 20s these days, is the period of like building your collage without necessarily sealing it in. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you I know, you said it's... one other thing. You said pay attention to those happy accidents. Right. The art of being in the present, you said, is that it allows us to see those happy accidents. I suppose right. if your life is a collage and you want to learn from everything, then everything is a happy accident, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think things happen all the time. And um, I'm not saying that everything that happens to you by coincidence, you should grab it and say, uh, okay, that happened, what can I do? But, but everything that happens to you is a call for your attention and is a call for your interpretation and to your decision. Is this good for me or is this not good for me? The first thing is just to listen, to pay attention to that. And, uh, and I think the metaphor of the highway is a great metaphor in terms that we all know because we go through life many times, our tendency, the tendency of our brain is to go to drive on a highway when we know that we will exit on uh, exit 93. And until then, we don't have to worry. We can talk on the phone. We listen to the radio. We are not there. And there might be a person on the side of the road with a sign that says, if you see me, I'll give you a million dollars and we, we will miss him. <laughs> You're so right. Um, okay, one last thing. There, there's so many that I want to ask, but okay, let's just, I noticed that you showed a lot of things that looked like faces. And I have to say myself and my children, we would go walking when they were small and we'd see houses that look like faces and fire hydrants that look like faces. Do you think that unconsciously people, um, uh, designers of items unconsciously make things look like faces? Is it possible? Um, I don't know about that. I, I know that um, many faces happen because of uh, the engineering need to create symmetry. So uh -huh. we will have two screws, you know, and once, but, but, we, but I know that we are, um, our brain is looking for faces all the time. We have a need to look for faces. And, and when we look at faces, we look for the biggest contrast that grabs our attention. And this is why we have the, the sclera, the white of the eye, that creates a big contrast with the pupils so that our brain will go to contrast, you know? Um, I have no idea. And I suppose that's yeah. true of black and white photography as well. And the second place is, is here, the teeth. You know, <laughs> so wow. we um, we see the expression. I can see whether you are nice to me or not, whether you will, um, you know, in Zoom is actually not that uh, I'm not afraid that you're going to eat me. But uh, but, uh, you know, from the old days, we need to see the person that we meet, whether they are friend or foe. 